Thank you, Michael, for the introduction and the invitation. So most of what my research focuses on is looking at social media data, how it's used during elections. So how are politicians campaigning? How are citizens, um, what are they writing in Facebook comments? How often are they writing? Things like that. But in the course of doing that research, a lot of hate speech does come up. So I'm well familiar with what type of discourse is happening on social media. And in particular, what I'm going to be focusing on in this talk is anti-Semitism and hate speech and the sort of dynamics of that and what we know from a research perspective, which isn't actually very much at the moment. But the aim of the talk is to first to get a sense of what, what are we, how are researchers conceptualizing platforms? And as I'll argue, it's a very political um, type of discourse that platforms use. The second aspect is to discuss how the EU is working with platforms to address hate speech and moderate and flag content and get it off of the platforms. Then I'm gonna take a little bit of a data science perspective and try to explain to you why detecting hate speech is very difficult from an automated perspective and how, what are some of the methodologies that are being used. And then actually look at how much anti-Semitism is actually on social media. And the answer is not so much as you maybe expect, but we're gonna find out where it really is and how it fits into the media ecosystem. And now I'm gonna offer a couple proposals that maybe you as educators can use um, in your classrooms or in, in your thinking about how to address uh, this issue. So there's been some work starting about 2010 about the politics of the term platform itself. So Tarleton Gillespie is an expert in this field and his definition that I've kind of compressed a little bit is Platforms, social media platforms, are online sites and services that host, organize, and circulate user-generated content. So the key is that the platforms themselves are not producing anything. It's only the users and individual people typing away, inputting commands on their, their phones. They build an infrastructure, a digital infrastructure, that allows for this user-generated content to go out to people, but also provides data to the platforms that they can use for advertising, right? And the last is that because these platforms have created a infrastructure that hosts this content, they have to somehow moderate the content on the platforms. That might mean taking off hate speech, but at a very broad level, to moderate means that whatever they're building is somehow guiding how communication and information goes across the platform. So why is that political? Because the term platform is a constructed term. They could have chose networking site. They could have chose media company. But they've chosen platform because they present themselves very much in this way. We are just an infrastructure. We are not accountable for what happens on our site. People come and go. You know, They use train platforms just to get from A to B. Someone who owns this platform is not going to say, I choose where people travel and how they travel. I just provide the service. Right? So basically, if you look back at how social media companies have been lobbying regulators and uh, different policymakers, they present themselves very much like this. We are just a neutral platform. In actuality, so this is what Facebook looks like on the back end. This is from some code from 2007. So now it's much more complex. But you'll see here's your birthday notifications. This is how it looks like on the back end. This is how it looks like on the front end, right? It's very different. But the point is, is that this code is created by humans. It's not, and it's changeable. There's updates every day to social media platforms because developers are changing the ways that these platforms are built. And this is different from the train platform I showed you before. So with that in mind, looking at how platforms moderate content they cannot be neutral just, we are a platform, because they're programmed by humans, and humans are not neutral. Because they're driven by a logic of profit, they need to make money. So the ways that they're designed is optimized to make money, which is not neutral. And when they let this code go, it might carry with it some bias. So these are things like, um, image classification software is wrongly categorizing African Americans as gorillas, for example, in the Google case. So this happens. If you Google um, white teenagers, you'll get pictures of 
stock photography, so buying photos that you can then use on a website or something. If you Google black teenagers, you will get mugshots from police stations. This is a problem with algorithmic bias. It's, it's not, the, the platforms don't mean to do this, but when you let something automated go, it could have some negative consequences. And so where my research kind of fits into this is I'm very interested in how the very ways that these platforms are built, so the kind of code you just saw, how that influences political processes. So I've sort of created this categorization where what I think is important to focus on is the network structure of platforms. So who are you allowed to be friends with? Do they have to accept your friend request or not? Are they allowed to be anonymous or not? These are the type of network aspects that I think are important to consider. Functionality, does it support videos, uh, pictures, just text? Is the limit as long as you want to type? Is it 140 characters? How do the algorithms work and what type of data is generated? And basically what I want to focus on, and I'm kind of laying the theoretical groundwork here so we can come back to it later, is that these type of design features influence how content is spread, which is obviously important when we're thinking about hate speech. So how is content spread on social media? So taking just one piece of that typology, looking at can you share or not, and how do you share? So on Facebook, you have the share button. Twitter, you have a retweet button that broadcasts out content to, to a bunch of people. Instagram, you can't share content to a wide amount of people on Instagram. It's not built into the platform. What you can do is you can tag your friends individually. So to give you an idea of like how you conceptualize this, let's say there's a piece of hate speech or fake news. Can it go viral on Instagram? Probably not, because you have to tag people individually in order to get the message to go. So as an example of connecting design features to political implications. Now, where this gets sticky is you might not be able to send this beyond, let's say here, five people. When you are tagged in something by a friend, it has more influence than if you were to see just a piece of content online. But let's look at YouTube. No mass sharing feature. You can't share on YouTube but you can share across platforms. So the way that YouTube hate speech or content would go viral is actually through other social networks. And the point I want to stress is that this is an ecosystem. It's not just platform by platform. It's that there's sharing that goes across these platforms. Okay, how is content moderated? So if you have a piece of hate speech the general way that it's reported, because platforms are neutral and they don't get involved, is that they rely on users to do it. So at the very top of this content moderation pyramid, if you will, you have the platforms. They're the in control, they're all the way at the top. Then you have administrators, or page administrators. These are people who have certain control over Facebook groups, over Reddit subreddits, over different spheres of the internet, where they're allowed to call the red card and kick out users. So these are referees of content. They can decide, we don't want hate speech here. We're going to moderate it on our own. And then you have the user community, which is the main way that platforms rely on con uh, to remove content, is that users signal to the platforms what to remove. And then the platforms have a team of people, could be in, could be in Asia, could be in the country, that decide, is this in terms with our guidelines or not. So as a general idea, these are kind of the three tiers. User communities, administrators, and then the ultimate power resides in the platform themselves. Okay, so because of this model where the users signal content to the platforms and they decide, the EU has decided that we're going to put a bit of pressure on the platforms by developing a code of conduct to counter illegal hate speech online. Are any of you familiar with this? little bit. So I had to go dig into it myself and it really had me thinking about um, with the Russian disinformation stuff in the US that in those Senate hearings and the hearings following that, it's very clear that legislators don't understand the technology of the platforms themselves, right? <laughs> so I think the EU is not really in a position to regulate because they don't know what or how they will regulate these platforms. 
So a code of conduct is sort of a framework of cooperation between private enterprise and the government. So the goal of this uh, initiative is that platforms should have in place a clear and effective process to review and remove hate speech, ideally under 24 hours. Now, the way they do this, and now we're going to start moving into the methodologies and data science part of the talk, is that what they've done is they've partnered with national organizations and NGOs in different countries to scan the platforms, to conduct their own analysis, flag hate speech, and they've developed two ways to test this. So on the one hand, these national organizations, they report content as a regular user, like you or I would. And then they've also tried this, these dedicated reporting channels, which are not very well described, but they're something like a special pipeline to remove content. So you have the normal way you would flag content, and then a special channel that's been developed. But we have no idea actually how they're doing this. So if you go and look into these reports, you'll see that it looks like hate speech is being removed faster, but we don't know actually what hate speech is. So I'm going to show you a sort of example of that. So they've done four monitoring evaluations every six months or so. So the first one was in December 2016. And this is the number of cases that have been flagged for legal hate speech, 556 in 12 countries. You'll see that Facebook amounts for about half of the content, Twitter and YouTube for about a quarter, and the 7% is Microsoft services. So I don't know if that's Skype or it doesn't say. And here's the breakdown by category, different types of hatred, um, ethnic origin, national origin, race. And here you have anti-Semitism as about one quarter of this sample size of flagged content to the platforms. This is the breakdown by the normal user versus the special review process that we don't know. And we'll see that, um, so Facebook and Twitter, or Facebook removed about 28%, Twitter 5% if you're a regular user, these special systems made uh, to improvement, and also on YouTube. And there's four of these reports, and I'm just gonna jump to the fourth one here I think it's interesting that they, they don't show this difference anymore in graphs, but they collapse it all together, which makes, makes it look arguably better than it actually is. And what we'll see is that each one of these is a different time period. So we'll see Facebook is getting better. They are moving 82% of the content that's reported as hate speech. Twitter getting better than drops, but still only 43% compared to 85 and 82 I think this has to do with the resources of Twitter. It's a much smaller company, so it can't actually have the, the, the resources to, to monitor as well as it, as it probably should. It could also be that, um, that Twitter has looser guidelines for speech. I'm not exactly sure. But this was, so here's the number of cases now in the latest report. It's over 4,000 and done by 26 countries. And in each of these countries, there's a particular group that is doing their own way of calculating hate speech and um, translating basically definitions of hate speech into how they see it. So in these 26 countries, you have maybe one, two, and so I think Germany has four different national organizations that are part of this initiative. And this is that breakdown by, by hate speech. And you'll see that there's more categories. And anti-Semitism drops to 10%. Hate speech. So if you just look at this at its face, you say, wow, anti-Semitism is going down in the past two years. It decreased from 25 to 10 percent. The problem is we do not know how they calculated hate speech. How did they define it? How did they monitor the platforms? How did different organizations in different countries actually go about identifying hate speech and flagging it? What's the proportion of hate speech to overall traffic? And I'm going to come back to this, because this is very important. And I think the key aspect here is differences in resources. You have organizations in 26 countries with different practices, different definitions, and this is actually how it looks in the report. So they say, ethnic origin, anti-Muslim hatred, and xenophobia were the most commonly reported on the grounds of hate speech. The results, which are in line with our previous reports, confirm 
the predominance of racist hatred against ethnic minorities, migrants, and refugees. But the data that we use may be influenced by the field of activity and the organizations participating in the monitoring. So what they're saying is, this is, this is what we define as the percentage of hate speech on social media, but we had 30, 40 different organizations working with different amount of resources, different capacities, and different definitions, arguably. So it's, it's like, the optics are very good. Hate speech is getting removed. More is getting removed, it's getting removed faster. But we really don't know. It's really, it's not transparent, this process. So I want to flag that because the way that organizations, scholars, uh, the platforms themselves are trying to detect hate speech is incredibly difficult. So the main approach is to use keywords and combinations of keywords to find, for example, tweets that are racist against immigrants or Jews or whatever category you want to put there. Then there's the machine learning approach, which basically has humans say what is hate speech and what is not, have the computer try to replicate that, take their data and crunch it across millions and millions of, of tweets and see, did it correctly classify hate speech or not? And if so, we can use it. If not, we can't. And this is interesting because probably the most sophisticated, um, at least on the public side, something that you can actually access is what's called the Google's Perspective API. So it's a tool that is developed to identify toxicity, which is a bit broader category than hate speech, but for our purposes here, we can use it. And toxicity is defined as rude, disrespectful, or unreasonable comments that are likely to make you leave a discussion. So they developed a tool using machine learning that will identify toxicity. And there's a point to note is that this is probably profit, profit driven because you want to keep people on your platform if you're a provider. So you want a tool that will identify when people are likely to be disgusted and leave a conversation. So keep in mind there's always this capitalistic logic behind these tools that are open to developers. Okay, how did it perform? So it gives you a scale from zero to 100% on hate speech. So um, this is from uh, an article where someone was basically just playing around with this API. So this sort of common trope of conspiracy theory, Jews control the banks and the media. Any guess as to how, what level of toxicity this would be? Look, exactly, 10% toxic. So then the, many decides to play with this idea, many terrorists are radical Islamists which, different context, but it's, it's relatively similar to Jews control the banks and the media in the sense that they're, you know, these could both be conspiracy theories, they could both be um, statements from one person to another that are not very different in terms of their length, they're not very different in terms of the connotations associated with them, right? They're both quite offensive, I think. This one's 92% toxic because it has words like terrorist and radical. Whereas Jews control the banks and the media, there's nothing really offensive here in the words themselves. Banks and media are just objects. But the machine can't understand the complexity of what those together mean. So then the guy takes an actual news statement. Three Israelis were murdered last night by a knife-wielding Palestinian terrorist who yelled, al Akbar. 92% toxic. Same score. Again, because again, it has things like murder, knife-wielding, terrorist. So these are the types of tools that Google, probably one of the most powerful platforms in the world, has put out for developers to identify toxicity. But I just wanted to show you that it's not, it's, it's difficult and it's not really perfected yet. So how much anti-Semitism is there on Twitter? And the reason that I use, I'm focusing on Twitter, I know it's not popular in Germany, um, but where a lot of these studies are being done in the States, it is quite popular, and it's actually one of the only platforms that we can get data from. So most of the academic research is on Twitter. We know it's not the most important or popular platform, but you can't access Facebook data, Instagram data, anything like that. So 
There was a study by the Anti-Defamation League. There's been a few of them. This is one of them in particular. So they set out to have this mission. How much hate speech, sorry, anti-Semitism was there between 2017 and 2018? And they used what's called a Boolean query, which is basically keywords with and and or. So you can be a bit more sophisticated, like this and this and not that. That's a Boolean query. They use them for, so this is much more transparent than the EU report I just showed you, because this kind of gives us an idea of what are they actually looking for. Words associated with classic anti-Semitic stereotypes, conspiracy theories, Holocaust denials, um, different code words, um, and, and symbols that are used by, by um, alt-right groups. And then what they did is they collected all of these tweets, and then they had, basically they took a random sample, so let's say they took a thousand tweets, and they coded how many were actually anti-Semitism. They took that 1,000 and they broadened it out to their, their, they made an estimate based on their random sample of how much hate speech there were, and they came up with this number. 4.2 million anti-Semitic tweets in one year. It's a lot of tweets. But what I want you to focus on is the distribution per day. It's between 50,000 and 100,000 anti-Semitic tweets per day, roughly estimated. And this got a lot of media attention, right? Twitter, anti-Semitism, huge problem. Now I'm going to show you, this is part two. This is a, a, a really sophisticated study, probably like, in what I do, this is probably one of the best studies. It's not out yet, so this is all kind of preliminary. It's not preliminary results, but it's, it's not published, so it's giving you a sense of, of what researchers are doing. Um, this is by a group at uh, New York University, which has huge resources, tons of people, um, hired computer programmers on staff, tons of money. So to give you an idea, this is a very large-scale project. These guys set out to test this claim. In the media, and I'm sure you're familiar with this claim, there's been a massive rise in hate speech on Twitter during Trump's election. So these researchers say it can go one of two ways. Either... Hate speech goes up steadily over time, or it stays flat and then jumps up when all the reporting is. This is around October, and the elections being the first week of November. So they okay. If it's true, it must be like this or like this. What did they do? They collected 750 million tweets referencing Trump and Clinton and different keywords associated with them. So I'm with her, make America great again. The Donald Trump data set was 500 million tweets, and the Hillary Clinton was 150. So more for, for Trump, and that's quite normal to see conservative uh, views getting more tweets. Then, and this is the interesting part, this is where it's important to contextualize. So they also took tweets that were sent by 500,000 Americans. Not representative of the population, just they had 500,000 people allow them to get their, their tweets. And so this is, this is a way to compare the political data set to a non-political data set. They use dictionaries and this manual check by humans. And they looked for all these different um, hate types with very established dictionaries of what, what these What's interesting is that they found that fewer than half of the speech, of the tweets that were identified as hate speech were identified as the code, or by the coders. So basically, by the dictionary method, less than 50% of what the dictionaries found was actually judged hate speech by human coders. So the Anti-Defamation League study used a similar check, but it did not report the actual percentage of hate speech tweets to regular tweets. So 4.2 million tweets overall, but what percentage of traffic on Twitter does that represent? This design allows for that calculation. So when we take all the hate groups, so anti-black, misogynistic, anti-Semitic, etc., you have this. This is the Clinton, Trump, and random data sets over the two years. And what you'll see, if remember, if we're looking for this increase in hate speech over time, Maybe for the Clinton data set, you see the hate speech start to rise and then drop after the election. But keep in mind those numbers on the left. 
So it ranges between 25,000 and 50,000 tweets. So actually what we're looking at is a very, very zoomed in chart. When we look at the proportions of how much hate speech was there relative to the overall Twitter data they collected, you'll see that, okay, it rises a bit, but it's between 0.001 and 0.002% of all tweets on the platform. It's a very, very small number of hate speech. If we look at anti-Semitism in particular, we see that at its most hate, hate, hateful, I guess is the word, at its most hateful, at the, mo the most activity in tweets relating to Donald Trump and right-wing movements, 0.00035% of tweets. But I think it's important to note that most of the tweets that are anti-Semitic on an average day are less than 0.00005% of tweets. It's a very hard number to wrap your head around. I can't do it myself. 0.00005%, it's like 10,000th of a percent. It's minuscule. So their study found that there was actually no systematic rise in hate speech. The dictionary approaches tend to overestimate, so the ADL approach is a bit suspect. And anti-Semitic tweets related to Trump were typically under this incredibly small number of tweets. So where is the hate speech on social media? It's on places like these. Do you know these websites, 8chan? Ooh, you guys are about to be in for a surprise. <laughs> in a not a good way. 8chan, 4chan, these are anonymous message boards that exist. These are like the dark corners of the internet. If you want to go check it out, you're more than welcome, but uh, I'll show you what it looks like in a second. And then there's Gab. Have you heard of Gab? Okay. Gab is like a Twitter alternative where people who get banned on Twitter for hate speech go to do hate speech. So, I'll just go ahead and preface it now. Mainstream social media platforms, hate speech is minimal. But it comes in these forums, and I'll show you the connection between the two. So this is what Gab looks like. Um, they were recently, they were I think, never allowed in the Apple, uh, Apple store, but they existed as a service, I don't know when they started, I want to say a couple of years now, 2016, 15, something like that. This is what the new site looks like because after the shooting at the synagogue in Pittsburgh late last year, that the shooter had a Gab account, so the, the website that was hosting Gab shut it down and they raised funding privately to come back online and it looks like this. So what, the way it markets itself is as a Twitter that allows for basically free speech, no restraints on what the content is, and um, it, it allows for more characters, so you can post more. Twitter was you know, restricted at 280 characters. I think this is 300, maybe a bit more now. And it has these sort of like news um, forums that you can go into these different topics of uh, conversation or news stories, and you can comment on them. Um, so it's been described as a Twitter and Reddit hybrid together. So I guess I, I went, this is like on Wednesday, I went and I just typed in Jew, and this is what came up, and someone was saying, I've been under attack from you know, the leftist liberal media. So it's a very kind of conservative platform. And then the first comment that I saw was this sort of really nasty um, hate speech filled just, you know, just junk. Someone just ranting with a bunch of slurs, and I mean, you can go ahead and read it, but it's just it's just really a bunch of venting and nonsense. So that's kind of what Gab is. It's a place where people go and they they spew a bunch of hate speech. And I mean, obviously by the fact that we're all here, we're obviously not going to be for this. As as you know, um, it's not particularly pleasant, but it's also not particularly dangerous. What's dangerous are these sites like 8chan and 4chan that are anonymous. And basically, this is where strategies are developed in order to manipulate young men and manipulate the media. So 
The idea, I'm not going to go into it too much, but the idea, what this person is saying is let's associate pornography with Nazi symbols, prey on young males who are sexually frustrated, and essentially take the Jewish girls and outbreak the race. Is essentially what that is. And that's pretty disgusting, right? So this gives you an idea of what the form looks like. So someone jumps in and they say, you know, who would associate Aryan symbolism with pornography, which is a conspiracy theory of Jews. This is disgusting that you would even propose this idea, and then other people are, are going on. So this is, what I want to show you with this, despite the fact that it's, it's graphic and highly offensive, is that this person is proposing a concrete action in order to go and spread this through social media and fake accounts. So this is the organizing hub of white supremacists, and there's a whole mix of ideologies that are, that are on these forums. And, and what's, what's so fascinating about these sites is that people can form sort of attack mobs and then vanish away. So they can organize and drop away. And that's why I don't think the Gab stuff is so much of a problem, because it doesn't have this organizing potential. On these sites, there is a, um, it's basically an ecosystem where people can, can organize on 4chan, go offline to a particular Slack group or a Discord group or some other social media, and what they do is they form a strategy, then they use the mainstream social networks to promote it, and the problem is that the mainstream media are the ones who pick up on these stories. So there's a sort of two-step flow in order to get conspiracy theories and hate speech into the mainstream media. You also have all these alternative media sites, um, you know, Breitbart, Daily Stormer. They provide these people with memes, ammunition, strategies. They also put it on, you know, you see Breitbart News, for example, on social media. And the mainstream media, in their hunt for the next controversial story and content, will draw from these alternative media sites as well. So the end goal for all these groups is to get stuff into the mainstream media. But the way they do it isn't on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. It's in these anonymous, um, anonymous posting boards that try to manipulate both social media and the mainstream media. So to give you a sense of the ecosystem of how that's going. And if you want to read more about these strategies, there's a great report put out by um, some academics that work at a group called Data and Society called Media Manipulation and Disinformation Online. And this categorizes all the different types of ideologies that are in there, all the different strategies they've used in the past. So I highly recommend um, you check that out if you're interested in kind of learning more about what's, what's going on in these boards. OK. So, so far. We've only really been talking about text, looking at dictionaries to identify hate speech. But obviously, you've just seen that images play quite a role. So how, are you, how many of you are familiar with memes? OK, we know what memes are. Here's a meme, um, which, are you familiar with this, the granny meme? So the granny meme, it's not funny in that it's sort of shaming non-literate um, non-media literate elderly. But it's funny because that's exactly the stereotype that it's playing on, right? And for those of you who don't know, the text might change, but the meme is always a joke about old people not understanding technology. So another one is like, oh wow, are emails delivered on Sunday? Like, because it's kind of funny. So the, the, the reason that this meme is funny is because there's a shared understanding of the picture. That there is, that's the kind of, I would call it a meta text. So it's not verbally expressed, hey, this meme is funny because you know, old people might not understand that they are being used as memes. It's funny because that's compressed into a visual that you decode by having seen other memes. So in that way, memes are very similar to political cartoons. So this was a, I was looking for a good example, and I couldn't really find one with hate speech. It's the best I could do was um, Roseanne Barr, a uh, celebrity um, actor, actress in the US, uh, was fired for tweeting some racist tweets. 
So you read the cartoon as the network ABC gives the boot to Roseanne Barr for her racist tweets. So here we have sort of um, a, a allegory to the uh, to the uh, connection to the Ku Klux Klan. Now. I'm trying to draw a comparison here because this cartoon makes no sense if you don't know the story. Or if you're a 10 year old, you might not think this is Ku Klux Klan Twitter birds. You might think it's a ghost, right? So that's try to, what I'm, I'm trying to make a comparison here that the meaning of this meme is about understanding the context of the series of memes that happen to be granny memes, just as Cartoons, political cartoons are powerful in the sense that you can decode the author's message or you have some understanding of the context. So I want to illustrate two things here. One is that visual format can sort of mask or gloss over inappropriate expressions. And this is a very powerful tool used by groups that are promoting hate speech. They hide their hate speech as humor. These different, you might see an Adolf Hitler meme, for example. On the positive side, it might not be decipherable by youth. So if you have these really nasty anti-Semitic images going around the internet, they need to understand the context so they can understand what it means. So there's kind of both a positive and a negative here. On the one hand, these images are really powerful, but only to the extent that people understand them. So I wanted to include this in this talk, because if you're working with kids, maybe you're super worried about what they're seeing, but they have to understand the context. So I came across this study, it's not a very famous study or anything, but it's a study that was conducted with 16 to 19 year olds in a uh, multi-ethnic British neighborhood. And they, I think there's only 12 students they interviewed, but they were trying to ask the students to interpret this cartoon for them. And this was around uh, 2006. So basically what you have here is, uh, you can't read it, it's George Bush as a sort of cowboy walking through the Wild West. And this is a, a vulture that says Iraq. And it's basically, it's high noon, Iraq's finally won, basically. So they, they interviewed these children and they, you know, the, the children could say, I'm sorry, 16 to 19, not quite children. They could say, some recognized it was George Bush, some didn't, some got that it was a cowboy and there was a big bird, but they, they, they could not comprehend what the author was trying to illustrate. And they, dealt, they developed this idea that interpreting political cartoons requires multimodal literacy. So it's not just one type of literacy, it's not just understanding you know, that there's a, a good guy and a bad guy. They need to understand the context of Iraq. They need to understand the context of how much war costs in order to understand that this bird is a vulture. It's a symbol. So some of the things they say that are elements of this multimodal literacy are knowledge of past and current events, being able to be familiar with the genre. So in the meme example, the meme is funny because it's in the genre of meme. If you've never seen a meme, you're not going to understand what that means. Same with political cartoons. You have to be familiar that political cartoons tend to make some type of point, a commentary, a joke. And then you have to have, crucially, an experience of thinking about political events in an analytical way. So the power of visuals is very much in line with the extent to which young people, anybody, can decode a picture and what it actually means. You have to get into the artist's frame of mind to understand what they are trying to say. So when you look at things like this, which is you know, a very controversial um, tweet that Donald Trump put out, where he later took it down in about two hours, where once Hillary Clinton became the nominee of the Democratic Party, there was this photo. Donald Trump says it's a sheriff star, like in the Wild West, so actually, Quite similar to, to that. But this became highly controversial as a symbol of anti-Semitism, a sort of encoded symbol of anti-Semitism. And a way to signal support in a very sneaky way to his white 
supremacist, white nationalist supporters, so called? I honestly, I don't know. I, I can't decode this. It really depends on, I guess, whether you're a Trump or you're a Hillary supporter. You're going to interpret this exactly the way that you want to. But the point is that if you were to show this to a 10-year-old, they're not going to get this association with anti-Semitism. Maybe in Germany, but most students wouldn't. And the money behind it. So thinking about that decoding process, I think, is, is really important. And I think the question for teachers is how can you teach your students to understand and think analytically about what the person is trying to send you. This is not a cartoon about uh, a gunslinging cowboy and a bird facing off you know, at high noon. It's a political critique that carries a lot of meaning, just as this one does. Whether it's an anti-Semitic symbol or whether it's a sheriff's badge, both have different meanings and they're both quite powerful statements for just a piece of graphic art, right? So, getting to my concrete proposal is there's a great, I was talking about it with Patricia, there's a great game called getbadnews.com. Check this out, and I think everything I've said will start to become a bit more clear. So, this is my proposal, by the way, getting students to think analytically about how to decode visuals with the specific focus on how to approach what the author is trying to say. So there's a great game, it's called the Get Bad News Game, and the idea behind it, it's, it's a way to teach children about disinformation by making them creators of disinformation. So the idea is you go to this game, you just log in on your computer or phone, and all you do is you click between these different options. So it's a very kind of quick, quick thing, and you you... Your goal is to get as many Twitter followers as you can and spread as much fake news as you can in a way that's going to convince people. So when I was playing, I chose my fake news outlet would be called The Honest Truth Online. Um, this is your Twitter follower account. This is your credibility. And as you go through the game, it teaches you. Like if you pick a bad option, so if I attack science, I might get some Twitter followers. But if I pick something like this, which is juice boxes are laced with drugs to keep us subdued, if I would post that, there would be a box come up and say, that doesn't make any sense. That's not a legitimate fake news um, thing. So it's, it's hard to explain, but check it out because it will become very intuitive how, how these uh, tools are very effective. And as you go through the game, you earn different badges like um, trolling and how to polarize, using emotions, um, creating conspiracy theories. And so by having... Children play this, I mean, probably not young children, but uh, older ones, they start to see what the strategies are behind people who are spreading disinformation, which they've added surveys to the game and conducted analysis where it does actually work, where they are more aware and able to understand what the bad actors' um, motives are who are trying to manipulate them. So, this is a funny anecdote. Uh, they also go around, the guys who created this, and they do some workshops in schools where they go to schools and they say, uh, you know, get in groups of two, and for the next hour, create the most ridiculous story that you can. Go on Google, get an image to go with it. And then they actually publish it on their webpage as a fake news story. And they ask everyone to share it on their social networks. Like, really sharing fake news. And if someone clicks on it, they will get a pop-up that says, hi, this is fake news. Click here to learn more. Please share this to your own social networks, but don't tell anyone it's fake news. And they see how far it goes. They do it only for one day, and they take it down to not be too unethical. But they, they kept one story up for a week, which was about a um, heat wave in the Netherlands. So they're a Dutch company. And this story by two students in the middle of winter that a heat wave was coming in one week, reached 800,000 people, which is 5% of the Dutch population. So to give you an idea about how this fake news can travel, then if you were the person who created that, or you know the person who created that, or you were affected by it, you come to realize how ridiculous the whole fake news thing is. Two 14-year-olds just reach 5% of the Dutch population on a story about a heat wave. It's crazy. But those type of exercises, I think, are very powerful, and they're off-the-shelf tools. This is already developed, so you don't need to go and um, you know, invest a lot or set up um, a huge 
consortium of people to come and develop something. You just go to getbadnews.com and you sort of teach your students what the message of the game is. I think this is uh, very powerful. Also with the, the gamification techniques, you can have your students try to beat each other in the number of Twitter followers by who could be the best fake news sharer. Okay, proposal two. This is something I mentioned at the, the last meeting, and this is, the, this is a more longer term, resource intensive approach. But I think that you can really, just as political campaigns do, just as marketers do, you can essentially use the power of the platforms back. So there's a lot of backlash with um, social media, especially Facebook, on their advertising. You can do it too. So I would say you, you can really develop a data-driven campaign, if it's anti-Semitism or on anything, where you find who is the target group you want to reach, and then you target them with information that's particularly suited to the content that they see and engage with every day. Listing support of YouTube influencers, for example. And what's great about these, these targeting options is that you get to see their effectiveness in real time. And if it's not working, you can improve it by split testing and refining the content. This is a very intensive, um, large scale, lots of resources, lots of time, but I think it's highly effective um, and not as uh, plug and play as the other ones. But basically, advertising on social media to create awareness about whatever it is that you're interested in. Proposal three is to not focus all the media literacy on the youth. So there's a study that just came out uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, that it was measuring who shares fake news. And what you'll find is that the large majority of fake news is shared by people who are over 65. In fact, age was the only variable in their study that was significant across everything. So it doesn't really matter if you were left or right. Right people shared right many people shared more fake news because of their age. Conservatives are generally older. So it's kind of crazy that the average, so like it's not even one in the sense, in the sense that each person who's over 65 shared 0.75 fake news stories. It can't happen. But the way the statistics work out is that you'll see young people aren't sharing fake news. They have the media literacy. So this idea that that young people need to be trained because they don't understand the technology, I, I think is not actually correct. I think young people have a very, very good understanding of social media. They grow up on social media. They're, it's from day one embedded in their social relationships. So they kind of know, they can smell when something's fake or funny and not authentic. It's the over 65s who can't. So a lot of the focus is on you know, youth and, and obviously that's important, but this is just kind of a way to bring some awareness that it's actually old people who are sharing disinformation probably also likely hate speech. They don't care, you know, they're old. There's a, there's a lot of reasons why people might do this. They're also posting in public forums. A lot of younger people are posting in back channel communication, Twitter, uh, direct message on Instagram, Twitter, stuff like that, WhatsApp. So, yeah. That's, that's sort of the, the plea, because the, the reason it's important is that if you can lower this number, you lower the amount of fake news that goes around. So older people are spreaders of information, or disinformation, and that might reach younger people. So if you want to sort of cut it out, you cut it out at the top, which is... So the concluding points, sort of bringing it all together, is that measuring hate speech and anti-Semitism is extremely difficult. We've seen that manual approaches that involve 40 different organizations across 20 countries are maybe not the best way because they're done differently. But also, automatic approaches are also very difficult as well. The anti-Semitism on mainstream social media channels is probably overstated. That's not to say, I don't want to take a position on whether it's too much or too little or what's the threshold. But the point is to say that according to the media and according to a lot of reports that are put out, there's a, maybe an incentive to overstate, where when you look at the methodology, it's not quite how it looks, just by reporting the 4.2 million tweet number. But 
these main stream social media platforms are strategically used by anonymous actors on those message boards to manipulate the media. And that's really where the, the strategy is. So my sort of counter radicalization strategies would be to focus on, for youth, data-driven, gamified approaches, collect data, use the data, and incentivize youth to participate through gamification. And for the elderly, that should be your focus of social media literacy because they are the spreaders of content. So, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>